it's everything. So, but anyway, I'm excited to be in the, in the house of the Lord today. God's been doing great things, and yeah, we did. We had an awesome growth track class. Uh, we talk about growth track. Some people's like, well, what's growth track? Growth track is kind of a catalyst to, if you want to learn, you know, more about the church, you want to become a member of the church, you want to get involved and start serving and, you know, and being a part of what we're doing and help, you know, in, in uh, seeing the vision uh, come to pass that God has given us, then, you know, that's something I highly recommend for you. We are going to be doing uh, small groups or life groups coming up uh, pretty soon, too. Uh, those are something you probably would want to write down if you're interested in those. Small groups or life groups is actually what we, we call those. Those are like a free market approach. And what that means is if, you've, if you have something that you would like to do, you would like to lead a group, um, it could be anything from Bible study uh, to frisbee groups. We had we've had bicycle groups, we've had sports groups, we've had there's of course we have men's group and we have ladies group and you know we have groups that you can get connected and you can get involved in. But also if, if there's something that we don't have and you feel like you know it, that it would be a good asset, then you know then do it. Lead a group and do that. So there's a church in uh, in Alabama. Uh, it's Church of the Highlands. They're the ones that started a Frisbee group, and then they got this huge parking lot, and those guys are out there, you know, they're throwing the Frisbee. And somebody said, well, the Frisbee, throwing, throwing Frisbee, that's not spiritual. And, you know, you get out there, and you start throwing that Frisbee, and you see, you know, people miss it, or they're playing a game, and they start losing in their game. You start seeing people's true selves come, you know, true colors, and, you know, and you start, that's where discipleship comes in, and, you know, and they'll do prayer requests, they have prayer. So those are just, you know, just some things that, that you know, we have available, uh, especially for the summer. You know, get involved and get connected, because if you don't get connected, you kind of will slip through. Some people are like that, you know, so I'm kind of, believe it or not, I'm very introvert type of a person, and I like to step back out of the crowd, you know, and kind of get away and kind of get off, to, you know, by myself. And I have, sometimes I have a hard time, you know, uh, talking to people, you know, carrying on a conversation. <laughs> and so I'm having a hard time talking to you right now. So, but, you know, you just, you just got to do it. You know, you got to step out of your comfort zone and you got to build relationships. If you don't, listen, it, I hear people say, well, I don't have any friends, but you're not making yourself available or you're not making yourself friendly. You have to pursue relationships, right? And uh, the kingdom of God, it's all about relationships. And so that's what we're doing. We're actually doing a series in, it's called Vertical Reality because the kingdom of God is about relationships. And first and foremost, the most important relationship is our relationship with God, right? And so that's our vertical, okay, vertical reality. And then horizontal is our relationships with one another. We have to have the body of Christ. It has to function together. We have to unify together. We do things together, okay? And so today we're actually doing part three. And uh, the title of today is, we've been, we've been going with game shows, so today is Survivor. How many of you have seen Survivor before? How many of you like that kind of stuff? I do. I like, I like to watch that kind of stuff. Like I watched this guy one time. Uh, he was out in the middle of nowhere. I don't know. It was Alaska or somewhere or way up in Canada. And uh, he was in his car and he was doing, he was doing his thing. He was showing like, well, what, what if? He does a lot of these what if scenarios. He's in his car and you're out in the middle of nowhere in the snow, blizzard, all of that stuff in your car breaks down. And he was there, I, he was there for, I don't know, like four or five days, maybe even longer. And it's just him. No, there's nobody. He has his own camera and he's got these lights, these special lights on his camera. And um, he survives. And he shows what you can do. And he started taking his car apart and uses, you know, use the seats to make a fire and uh, just all of these things that, you know, that you can do that you just never, you know, you never would think of. And, and just that's, that's what he does, you know. How many of you think you could survive? There's a few of you in here. Yeah. If the zombie apocalypse came, not that it would. <laughs> Caroline says we're going to your house. So. All right. 
Need I say more? All right. So let's look at our focus scripture today. <laughs> wow. Okay, so Colossians 2 and 17 is our scripture reading for today. And this is going to be so encouraging. I know this, is, this has been a lot of basic stuff, but, you know, if we build a good foundation when the storms of life come and the winds come, and that you, you, you're not going to be shaken, okay? And that, that's the whole idea. In Colossians 2 and 17, it talks about the, the reality is found in Christ, okay? It actually reads the reality, however, is found in Christ. And so just a quick review. Our first week in part one, we did American Idol. And what we did is we took, we took a look at modern-day gods. Uh, we looked at the first of the Ten Commandments where it says that thou shalt have no other gods before me. And we define what an idol is. An idol is anything that replaces the one true God. And uh, we looked at uh, places that uh, have a tendency to become gods in our life. And three of those places was power, pleasure, and possessions. Those things can get in the way and become gods in our lives if we're not careful. And so what we wanted to do is we broke those down and we looked at five areas that we could start putting God first in our lives. And the first one was in our finances because, see, God says money is the number one test of our priorities. So think about that. The second one was interest. What are your interests? God wants to be in your life, not just on Sunday. Okay, make him first by inviting him in everything that you do. And the second, uh, the second, or no, the third one was relationships, which we've already talked about that. But if you want to put God first, choose your friends carefully because, see, the thing is, is that some people in your life will pull you away from God. Okay, so be wise and choose your friends carefully. Some people you're just going to have to keep them at a distance. Uh, and then the fourth thing was troubles. And that is when you're faced with unexpected problems and pressures, when you have a crisis, who do you turn to? You should turn to God first. Turn to me first is what the Lord says when you've got a problem, okay? A lot of us, we have a tendency to talk to all of our friends before we do, before we do anything or go to talk to somebody else. And a lot of times those people, they're not even godly people. They don't even know nothing about the Bible. And so the second week, part two, we did extreme makeover. And this is where God wants to do an extreme makeover on all of us. In everybody's life, God wants to do an extreme makeover. And that theological word for extreme makeover is regeneration. Regeneration is actually a process. Everybody say process. All right? So he's still working on me. He's still working on you. And he's going to complete the work that he started. You know, a lot of times we see things in people's life, sometimes maybe even in in our own life, and we think, man, I'm just not going to make it or I'm just not doing too good at this, you know, this walking with Jesus or this being a Christian kind of a thing. But, you know, the truth is, is looking back in hindsight, you can't say a whole lot about a person's life, about where they are, where they've been, where they are right now, okay, and even where they may be going. But then after it's all said and done, when you look at somebody's life, then you can tell about their character. You can tell about their integrity. You can tell about their walk with God. And that's why we have to be careful before we judge and before we start to cast stones and, or we start to say things, well, like, you know, I just don't think that person's going to make, I don't think they're going to make it. You know what you should be doing? You should be praying for them. You should be encouraging them. And you should, you know, and you remember, you see, God, God, he's the, the Bible says that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. Another translation reads that he's the author and perfecter of our faith. And so he's going to complete the work that he started in you, but you have to surrender to that. And you're going to have failures. You're going to have shortcomings. You're going to make mistakes in life. You're going to have frustrations and trials and tribulations. And and literally, sometimes your world will be shaken. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute. But we looked at three... uh, the three things in the book of Corinthians where the Bible describes three different types of people. That was the natural man. This, this is where there was no makeover has been done yet. This person is lost. They don't know God. Then there is the worldly man where this person is a mixture of the two, uh, of the spiritual man. The spiritual man is the spirit makeover that has taken place in this person. They're brand new. The one, this is the one that who can understand God's word. Uh, whenever you're born again, God gives you an understanding. He starts to lead you and guide you through the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that he'll lead you and guide you into all truth. 
Okay, so when you start reading the word of God, you start studying the Bible, you start hearing what the voice of the Lord is speaking to you through his word and confirming in your life, then he's leading you. You start to make decisions based on the promises and based on his word and based on what he's saying, your life will begin to change. And so today... And, and let me just say this too, uh, it, all of this begins with salvation. It begins with new birth. It begins with being born again. It's a true conversion. I, I want to be careful to say, you know, a lot of times when we live in the Bible Belt, and this is something all over the world, and I think we have to be careful with it, um, especially in the Bible Belt. We, ha- we have this mindset that if I just believe in Jesus, I'm saved. Okay, there's saving faith. You can believe in something and never have salvation. I, I've always, growing up, you know, as a preacher's kid, going to Bible school or going to a Christian school and, you know, learning about the Bible and things, I've always been a believer, but I was never saved. Okay, I've always been a believer. But until I repented, until I gave my life to Christ, and there had been times through my walk where, you know, I'd prayed to God and I'd even invited Jesus into my heart but it wasn't, it, it, there wasn't a change there. A lot of times I was in a mess. I was in trouble, whether if I was a little kid uh, being in the principal's office or whether I was in a, you know, a, a teenager being in the back of a police car or, you know, even a young adult, you know, be, getting myself in messes. I would be like, I'd be praying to God, you know, God, if you can get me out of this, I'll never do this again. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to straighten up. I'm going to live for you. I'm going to start doing right, but I don't do it. Right? True repentance is not just lip service. It's not just saying, I believe. It's turning from that and walking towards. It's moving towards. It's growing. It's, it's got a made up mind that no matter what comes my way, no matter what tries to knock me down, whether it be the enemy, whether it be the things of this world, whether it be even people that I have in my life, I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. And I'm going to allow the process. I'm going to allow God to work on me. I'm going to allow God to do what he needs to do in my life. And sometimes that hurts too. Sometimes you get, you know, if you know anything about the Bible talks about the potter's wheel. And if you know anything about pottery, if you've ever played with, with a potter's wheel and on clay, you know, that wheel starts turning, you put that lump of clay, just a bit of big old, you know, slap that lump of clay on there. And as it's spinning, you can start to shape that thing. You can start to mold it and, and make it into, you know, whatever shape of a, you know, a pot that you want, you know, and, but what happens though, there's lumps in that clay and you got to work those out. You're supposed to work it all out before you, you know, you put it on the potter's wheel, but sometimes it doesn't happen that way. You know, when you're on the potter's wheel, sometimes it gets hot. It gets hot and we want to jump off. My wife always, she talks about, you know, um, testimonies in her life about times when she wanted to jump off the potter's wheel. And I've had times in my life where it's like, man, this is getting, you know, the heat's on, you know what I mean? I don't know if I like this, but God's doing something. And so just allow him to do the process. So, but that's what, that's what that makeover is. And that's where that new birth, that's where that making a true commitment to Jesus, becoming a disciple, not just a believer, but a follower, okay? And that all begins at salvation. So part three, that was, I know it's a lot of review, and uh, Blair said, uh, what, what do you think the odds are of you finishing all your notes today? I said, about 50-50. And so <laughs> I'm going to move as fast as I can. I started out with four pages, and after last night, uh, you know, I just kind of had my outline, and that's good enough, Good enough. We could have done the outline, but we'd probably get out of church early too. Uh, so I added, I added more, and I think I got like nine or ten. I don't know how many pages I got. So if I'd shut up talking, I would probably move right along. <laughs> what are you laughing at? I'm, I'm, I'm happy today. I have a lot to say, so let me say it, all right? I'm going to stick to my notes. If, if I look up, you all say, preacher, get your, get your nose back in your notes. No, don't do that because <laughs> uh, uh, – Blair did say, he said, well, I see you got your notes, but he said, but what about the rabbit holes? <laughs> I said, well, you got me on that because we've done been down a lot of rabbit holes already. I like rabbit holes. <laughs> that's, that's, that's where the anointing comes. All right, pastor, moving on. <laughs> Caroline said, move, it, move along. <laughs> Nothing to see here. So today, survivor, as we go into this, 
Let's just pray over the word. Father, continue to have your way with this series. Lord, uh, open our hearts. Let it fall up on good ground. That it won't, we won't just be hearers of your word, but we'll be doers. We'll make it practical to our lives. We'll, we'll stand on those promises. We'll stand on those principles, and we'll make them active in our lives, not just learning about them. In Jesus' name, amen. So we talked about watching Survivor. And, you know, I think the reason why a lot of people like that is because we can identify with their troubles. Or you can identify with the what ifs of life because life can have some twists and turns and unexpected things happen. It's like, man, I was not prepared for this. And Survivor, you see these people, they're prepared for a lot of things Okay, you can learn a lot of things in school. I learned a lot of things in Bible college about pastoring and about church growth and stuff like that, but none of it prepared me for the reality of the real world. Okay, it's all in theory. But we can identify with their troubles, and sometimes it seems like what you're dealing with at the moment is far more difficult than even what these people are that, you know, they're going on these islands or going to these places and they're learning how to survive. Could you go on Survivor? Some of you said yes. Do you think you could handle what you have? Do you think they could handle what you've gone through? You know, just just some things to to think about. Here's Here's the reality. I believe that we're tougher than what they even go through. Some of the things that, that, that we're dealt with in life that we have to deal with and that we have to walk through and that we have to learn to overcome or sometimes just learn to, you know, to deal with it, okay? It makes you tough. Their game ends. On Survivor, their game ends. But sometimes it seems like yours just keeps going, don't it? Right? It could be parenting. It could be you're dealing with rebellious children, rebellious teens, It could be just disappointments in life, taking care of your parents. Maybe you have, you know, elderly parents now and and you're having to make decisions. You're having to do, I was just talking to a gentleman recently now that, you know, the tables have turned and now he's having to take care of his parents and there's just a lot of issues, you know, that you just, you, you never thought you'd have to deal with before. The death of a loved one, nobody ever expects that. We just, you know, we have this in the back of our mind that everything's going to always be okay. And then, you know, some, all of a sudden you turn that corner and, you know, you lose somebody that's close to you. Maybe it's a divorce. Maybe it's debt. Maybe it's business, uh, uh, a business failure, difficult people. Difficult people are hard to deal with. And I'm finding it more and more and more in everyday life in public places that people are becoming more difficult to deal with. And you really have to learn to walk in the fruit of the Spirit and exercise self-control. I mean, we literally, my wife and I, over the last week, there's been a handful of people, you know, that have been yelling at us, you know, through the car, uh, you know, either, you know, I was going to say the way she drives, but she's a really good driver, so there's no reason for anybody to to ever yell at her, you know. But uh, anyway, yeah, she, she likes to go a little fast sometimes, and, yeah, we had somebody cuss us out yesterday, you know, when she was turning the corner, but, I mean, you know. I, she wasn't going that fast. But anyway, but yeah, he started cussing. And so, yeah, you know, I just knocked on the window at him, you know, like, you know, like, bring it on, buddy. You know, and I'm like, well, what did I just do? You know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, it's like, it just kind of flies all over. You, you lose your self-control and a virtue of the fruit of the spirit is self-control, you know, but when somebody wants to get up in your face and act all bad and stuff, you're like, <laughs> You know, you want to just get back at it. That's, us guys have a tendency to do that. And so you women too. Some of you women have to do that. But you have to catch yourself. And you have to, you know, you have to keep yourself, you know, under control. Like none of you have ever done anything like that before. So. <laughs> I'm, oh, yeah, we're talking about Jesus, right? I was, <laughs> Caroline said I was going to help. I was going to tell him about Jesus. <laughs> No, at that moment, I was thinking he's going to meet Jesus. <laughs> Cussing at me like that, buddy. Cussing at my wife. Come on. <laughs> and it, yeah, I mean, immediately after you do something like this, it's like, man, that, that, that was uncalled for. It was unnecessary. I didn't have to do that. I could have just shook my head or whatever or just ignored it. You know, it just flew all over me, and I, I just kind of flew off the handle a little, little bit. And I didn't give him the finger, Okay that's the first thing that popped in my mind. I was going to do that. I I felt to do that. And I'm like, I had to catch my flesh. 
I had to bring it under control. I'm just being real with you. I was mad. I was like, you're cussing at me. How dare you? We, You know, there's issues like that. You just want to go. I'm, hey, this preacher up here behind the pulpit talking about giving somebody the finger. I've done that before. But we don't do that. And when you do that, what do you do? You feel bad about it. That's a good thing because the Lord's dealing with you. You shouldn't have done that. You've got to exercise gentleness and self-control. You've got to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. And so what do you got to do? You got to repent. God, I'm sorry. I messed up. I'm not going to do I need to get better. What did you learn in that situation when you fly off the handle? You learned that you like self-control and you need to get better at it. Huh. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. All right. So, man, I'm going to tell you what. I've came a long way. I have come a long way because I used to be a hothead. I'd lose my temper easy, and I've over the years, I've gotten way better at, that, at those kind of things. He's still working on me. <laughs> Here's what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our troubles. And verses 8 and 9, we jump on down, it says, we do not want you, you know, Paul's talking to the Corinthian church here. He says, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships that we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. Aren't you thankful that you don't have to rely on yourself? Because if I know if I have to rely upon me, I'm going to make a mess. And so somebody said we're going to (coughs) starve. Excuse me. And so how does God comfort us? Let's take a look at some things here. There's four ways. Jesus, we look at Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Word and even Christian friends. Jesus, because, see, he's felt what you feel. The Bible says, Hebrews 4 and 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one, listen to this, who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Just, he was tempted just as you were, or are, but yet was without sin. He maintained, he kept himself together. Well, yeah, but he's Jesus. He was God manifested in the flesh. But yeah, Jesus walked in the flesh and that flesh he had to contend with. And that flesh is just like our flesh that he, that he walked in. The Holy Spirit, that's his, it's the ministry of the Holy Spirit to be the comforter. He's, he's the one that's called alongside. He's the one that empowers. He's the one that gives you, empowers you for the work or for the process, okay? John 14 and 27 says, peace, this is Jesus, he says, peace I leave with you and my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. God fills us with his spirit, that comforter, that peace, there's a peace that, that transpires. When you truly are walking with the Lord, you have a peace when you're going through the fire. All right? A lot of us, we want to jump off the potter's wheel, but there's a peace in knowing that I know that God's up to something. I know he's doing something in my life. I've gotten better over the years, and I'm a patient person, and I'm a faith person. I have, I have great faith. I have a better faith than most people. And when I say great, that may not be saying much, but, you know, Jesus said, you know, if we have the faith of a mustard seed, we can move mountains, right? And so having that has helped me to stay focused. It's helped me to stay on track. It's helped me to continue to pursue the call of God, regardless of the setbacks and the times in my life that I just said, like, I can't do this no more. I want to throw in the towel. I want to give up. I would rather be doing something else, or there's just got to be more to life than this, you know, kind of moments. You know what I'm talking about? But I keep my faith in him, and I remember God, you called me, you've equipped me, you've given me everything that I need, you've given me promises, and all I have to do is continue to move forward with what you've done or what you have for my life. That's it. And God has blown my mind throughout the years. 
the word, the word of the Lord, the Bible, it prom- it, it, there's promises. Listen, there's promises for every situation. Psalms 1, 19 and 50 says, my comfort in my suffering is this, your promise preserves my life. That's just one of many. Your friends, Christian friends, okay? Christian friends, where this is where you can be real. True Christian friends, you can be honest. You can open up and you can talk about your struggles and your failures, your shortcomings and your sin because they're not gonna judge you. In fact, you're gonna find out when you, when you have a group of friends that you can trust, that's why we do small groups and we keep it, what's inside the small groups, inside the small groups that don't go outside of those. That way you can talk about things because the book of James talks about when we confess our faults and our sins one to another, there's healing that takes place, okay? Because what happens, you start to confess things and share. For, first, you confess them to God always. You always confess. Um, there's healing that happens in your body physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually when you confess your sin to Jesus. Because I've heard people say, you get, what was that scripture? Uh, as a couple of Wednesday nights ago, that, it, was, it was an Old Testament scripture. If you can remember that, it, it literally says that. Yeah, look for it, and if you get that, we'll put that up there for, for the church. But, but there, there's healing that takes place. And I don't know if you know this, but the word salvation, it, the, the Greek word is sozo. That means complete. God wants you complete. Not just your spirit to be saved. He wants your mind to be healed. He wants your body to be healed. How do you get that? You walk it out. You learn to apply God's word to your life and walk it out by faith. It's good, it got quiet. But your friends, Hebrews 10, 23 through 25, it says, let us hold unswervingly or unwaveringly to the hope that we profess for he who promised, that's the Lord, is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. What day? The day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord. Well, what is he talking about meeting? Meet where? He's talking about the body of Christ meeting together. Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. God wants you to be more than just a survivor. You talk to a lot of people and they're, they're just thriving. They're like, you know, I'm just, I'm doing the best I can to thrive. You know, I'm trying to make it. I'm trying to make ends meet. I'm trying to, I'm struggling, to, you know, to get through. I'm just, you know, you, you, that's, that's what makes you tired. Have you ever been in a situation, maybe, have you ever, maybe when you were a kid or an adult, I don't know, you ever tried to climb up a hill, I mean, a really steep hill, and it's like muddy, and then you're like, you know, you're just, you're moving and your body's just, it's just sliding down. You can't, no matter what you do, you can't get to the top. We have wolves in our backyard. We do, that's, that's like for real. And uh, we have 14 of them and we have them separated in, you know, in twos as couples. They dig, they dig to China. Okay. I have to fill holes sometimes. I mean, sometimes it's all day filling a hole that, you know, one of them dug, especially during the season, whenever they're getting, they're, they're going to have pups. They, 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 they dig dens. I can literally crawl inside and curl up in a ball and go to sleep kind of thing. Well, I fell in one of their holes last week <laughs> and my whole body disappeared and they were like looking down at me like, what are you doing down there in my den? You know? So I know what that's like. I know what it's like. Because, I mean, I had my footing. I thought I was okay. And it just started going down. It just fell through. And I'm, there I am. I'm in the hole. So I know what it feels like. <laughs> like the reality, you know, we go through things in life and it's hard. And you feel like you're falling. You know, you can't get, I couldn't get out. But God wants you to be more than a survival. The devil wants you to be bitter. He wants you to be bitter. He's going to, things that happen in life, if you're not careful, is going to make you bitter. You're not going to have a smile on your face. You know, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the joy of the Lord is your strength. 
And even when you're going through trials and you're going through uncertainty, there's a still, there's a glimmer of a smile. Even if you, maybe your face may not be showing it, but there's a joy inside of you that people don't understand. It's like, man, there's something about them. I know what they're going through and I just, I see how they're just, they just keep moving forward. They keep marching forward with their marching orders. God wants you to be better. I'm telling you today, God wants you to be better. He wants to make you better. And God has the unique ability to turn things around and make something good come out of those. Romans 8 and 37 says, No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You can't make it go away sometimes. Some things you can't take back. Some things you just have to deal with. But you can let it produce something. Did you hear that? Whatever you're going through or when you're going through or whatever your past has dealt you, let it produce something. Your struggles, your failures, your addictions, your habits, your sin, you give them to the Lord, those become a ministry Those become your testimony. Those become the words that you can use to share with people. I was this, remember? We talked about that last week. I was this, but now I'm that. I was like that, but now look what God has done for me. And he's forgiven me and he's lifted this burden and he's he's taken all of these weights off of me. And it's so much easier to run the race without all this baggage. Romans 5, 3 through 4 says that we know that suffering produces perseverance. Write that down. You're going to need it. You're going to need it. We know that suffering produces perseverance. And then it goes on, but uh, perseverance, character, and character, hope. So let's take a look at these today. I'd like to call these the marks of a true Christian. I'd like to call these the marks of a mature believer. Perseverance, it's the outplay, the outcome. When I think about perseverance, I think about endurance. I think about, I, I think about my son, Casey, he went, he's back there, he's sitting in the middle, back there. He went through, when he was in the Marines, they went through the crucible. I've heard about the crucible before, but really didn't know a whole lot about it until, you know, we know he was going through basic training and the crucible was coming up. So we started to read about, we started to read about what the crucible was, man. Man, you come out there, after you go through that, you are a Marine, no doubt. Literally, I don't, I, he didn't know this, but after he, after he got out and he went to the doctor and they did x-rays, they found out he had a broken foot. That broken foot happened during the crucible. And he went through the crucible. Is that, am I right? Yeah, pretty much. It wasn't a bad break, but a break's a break. You know, if your foot's bothering you, even in basic training, and you keep going. But you got to persevere. And it's like if, you've, if, if, if those of you who are runners, if you're a runner, you know the runner's high. You get to a place where you're running, and it's like, I can't go no more. I just can't. I've got to stop. I mean, I mean, you see people. You see people, you know, they're running out on the field and track, and there's, they're puking everywhere, you know. That's not good. <laughs> but what happens, though, you keep pushing, you keep going, you keep running, and all of a sudden they get this, what they call a runner's high. And it's like you're not, it, it happens that way with a lot of things. Fasting, when you're fasting, when you're doing biblical fasting, usually about three, somewhere in between three to seven days, everybody's different. Uh, you go without food, you start, you know, it's like God's giving you the strength, Let's see what the Bible says. Hebrews 10, 35 through 36, it says, so do not throw away your confidence. Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. It's exciting. You got a promise on the other side of that. So persevere, hang in there. Look at your neighbor and say, hang in there. You see, throughout the New Testament, as believers, 
We're, we're urged to view problems and trials from a heavenly perspective. We, we're urged to view trials and tribulations from a kingdom of God perspective. It's not of this world the way we see things, okay? It's from a spiritual perspective. It's from an eternal perspective. James says that we ought to consider our troubles an opportunity for joy. So think about that. When you're going through that trial, it's like, I got an opportunity for joy right here. Crossing your fingers, right? You know what I mean? This is, that's reality. We're, we're, but listen, keep your faith in him, trusting. You see, they produce in us character quality that is key to staying the course and finishing well. James 1, 3 through 4, the, the, on down a little bit in James chapter 1, it says that you, this is so awesome. The testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you, that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The word translated perseverance literally means the power to withstand hardship or stress. The power to withstand hardship or stress, especially the inward fortitude necessary to endure. Other translations render the same word as steadfastness, endurance, patience. The testing of our faith that produces the power and inner stamina necessary to patiently endure hardship and even persecution and grow into spiritual maturity. You see, in a parallel teaching, the Apostle Paul, he asserts this. He says in Romans 5 and 3, he says that we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop Endurance, there's that word again. Uh, Peter, the apostle Peter, he, he actually says in 1 Peter 4 and 13, he says, instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all of the world. I like to think about in the Old Testament when you go through trials, and we'll talk about some of these, uh, some of the people the things that they've walked through and that they, that they had to deal with and how they overcame. But then when, you know, when I read this scripture in the New Testament, I think about, I mean, even the apostles and the early church, what the persecution and the troubles that they went through, but what Jesus went through on the cross and even before going to the cross, even the night before, all of that stuff. And you think about, you know, he went through that and then you compare it to what you're going through now. Like it just... There's no comparison. Peter also says that the testing of our faith through trials, it proves the, the legitimacy and authenticity of our faith. That's another write, write it down worthy, worthy write it down note taker kind of. That right. You, you know what I mean? Write it down. <laughs> it's just worthy to write down. First Peter 1, 6 through 7 says this. This is what he says. So be truly glad there's wonderful joy, joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire and purifies gold. Through your faith is far more, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus is revealed to the whole world. You see, it's one thing to stand firm on our convictions when everything's going well and our faith remains untested. All right? But let me ask you this. How do you react when God seems silent how do you react when everything is falling apart? How do you react when your heart is broken and your dreams are shattered? There's where the test comes. You see, it's then, it's only then that the trials of life, of this life, truly test our faith and provide an opportunity to, pro to produce perseverance and steadfast endurance that develops spiritual wholeness and maturity in us. You see, when our confidence in Christ is proven unshakable 
And I talked about this in the first week. I talked about building our house on the rock, the rock of Christ Jesus, because if we built our, our, our house on a sandy foundation, when the storms of life come, it's just going to blow away. But when we're built on the house of our, we're built on a firm foundation of Christ Jesus, we build our house on that, the storms of life comes and you won't be rooted up. You'll be unmovable. And I'm going to tell you something. The enemy sometimes will come at you in every possible way to try to uproot you from your relationship with God. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. Remain steadfast. Endure. Endure. Because I'm telling you, it's going to get hot sometimes. Let perseverance finish its work. And when we continue to follow Jesus, we let our roots grow down into him and our lives be built on him and our faith grows strong, stronger in the truth. And Colossians 2 and 7 says that, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. Ready? Here's what it says, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Now, that's, 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 that's one that's tricky right there. When I first heard this taught out of the Bible, I, never, I didn't know it was in the Bible. I was in my 20s, early 20s. Give thanks in all things. And so when you're going through trials and tribulation, when your car blows up, your house burns down, and you fall into a big old sinkhole, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Everything's falling apart. Praise be to God. Thank you. How do you do that? Just open your mouth and thank him. Give him thanks. Because he's in control. It produces life. The testing of our faith produces life. When when you have, when you're thankful, the Bible says this in Matthew 10 and 22. I didn't, I didn't put the scripture there. I didn't put it up. But Jesus says that you'll be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Thankfully, perseverance doesn't depend solely on our efforts. Praise God. You see, as followers of Jesus, what happens is the spirit of God is at work in us. It's given us the power and the strength to persevere Before we go to number two, the the next one, I want to talk about the story of Joseph. If you're not familiar with that, it's Genesis 37. I encourage you to read the story of Joseph. It actually covers uh, chapters 37 uh, through 50. And so I don't have to, I don't want to read all of those chapters. I want you to read them, okay? That's, That's your homework assignment. But in a nutshell, Joseph was tricked by his own brothers, And they sold him into slavery. His brothers sold him into slavery. They even went back and told their dad, you know, that a a wild animal had killed him and they brought back his coat of many colors. He was framed by Potiphar's wife and he was even forgotten in prison. He spent almost even a, a decade in prison. A lot of us were thinking in the back of him, man, how, how, How could this happen in my life? Put yourself in Joseph's shoes. Most of us would become bitter. How could God allow this? People start saying, how could God allow this to happen? Why is all this happening to me? But yet it wasn't until many years later that Joseph could see God's hand in his trials. And did you know that he remained faithful? His character and his integrity He never wavered. He kept his faith and his trust in God. But many years later, you could see the hand of God in his trials. But then he could say this to his brothers in Genesis 50 and 20. This is many years later. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. I'm not going to give you the whole story, but when you read it, it'll blow your mind what all that that God gave Joseph and even restored his relationship with his family. Just be faithful. Just be faithful. I don't know what it's going to look like. I can't tell you 
God knows. But whatever you're going through, you, you, you be faithful to him and he'll work it out. The second one is this. The first one was perseverance. The second one is character. It's, it's, a, it's a maturity. Bad situations communicate good solutions kind of a thing. Uh, you're learning uh, uh, through wisdom. Ask God for wisdom, mature, growing. James 1, 20, uh, 2 and 4 says, consider it pure joy. There, there's that word. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Consider it pure joy whenever you fall in the hole. Consider it pure joy whenever everything around you is just blowing up in your face and everybody is against you. And no matter what you do, it just seems like you can't get anywhere. Consider it pure joy when it just seems like it's just everything is falling apart in your life. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. We're talking about character here. A.W.R. Tozer, or A.W.R., where'd the R come from? (sighs) Character is defined as strength of moral fiber. In A.W. Tozar, he described character as the excellence of moral beings, as the excellence of gold in its purity, and the excellence of art is at its is in its beauty, so the excellence of a man is his character. Okay? Persons of character are noted for their honesty, their ethics, their charity. Descriptions such as a man of principle or a woman of integrity are Uh, assertions of character. A lack of character would be, for example, moral deficiency. A person lacking character uh, tends to have dishonesty. They're unethical. They're uncharitable. A person's character is the sum of his or her dispositions, thoughts, intentions, desires, and actions. But I want to say this too. I want to caution you. You know, it's good to remember that character is gauged by general tendencies, not by the basis of a few isolated actions. So just because somebody makes a bad decision one time, you don't pin that as that that's the way their character always is. But if they have a tendency to do the same thing over and over and over, you can pretty much count on that's their character. And they need a change. They need a change. David was a man of good character. You read about David. David was a man after God's own heart. David... There's so many good things about David that we read, but there's also some bad things. David, David sinned on occasion, okay? King Ahab may have acted nobly once, but he was still a man of overall bad character, okay? Even bad people sometimes do good things, all right? So several people in the Bible are described as having noble character. And just to name a few, there's Ruth, there's David, Job. Job maintained all throughout all of the trials that he was going through. And these individuals' lives, they, they were distinguished by persistent moral value. And so character is influenced and developed by our choices. You get to choose every day your actions and reactions to things. Proverbs 3 or no, 11 and 3 says the integrity of the upright guides them. Proverbs 10 and 9 says, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his way crooked will be found out. It's the Lord's purpose to develop character within each and every one of us. Uh, Proverbs 17 and 3, listen to this, the crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. Hmm. We develop character by controlling our thoughts, practicing Christian virtues, guiding our hearts, guarding, guarding our hearts, and keeping good company. And then number three, and we're going to wrap this up here in just a minute, but number three is hope. Hope. Titus 2, 11 through 3. Hope outlasts. Hope focuses on the other side. You can always see the light at the end of the tunnel. And if you're at that place where you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, keep walking, keep moving forward. My wife, she's one of those type of people that she's got this righteous indignation and she'll challenge, she's like, Lord, bring it on. 
because I want to get through this. I don't want to have to walk through it and go around in circles with it. Let's get, what am I supposed to learn through this? Let's get through it. Let's get through it. Whatever I need to learn, let me learn because I don't want to go through this again. Titus 2, 11 through 13 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, the Bible's got a lot to say about hope. Biblical hope has its foundation Its foundation is faith in God. The word hope in the English conveys doubt. Do you know that? In in our English dictionary, in our English way of thinking, hope conveys doubt. For instance, I hope it will not rain tomorrow. There's a a little undercurrent of doubt right there, right? I'm not sure what it's going to be like tomorrow, but I just hope it doesn't rain. In addition to the word hope, it's followed by the word so. How many of us have been guilty? I hope so. I sure hope so. This is the answer that some may give when asked if they think that they will go to heaven when they die. I hope so. However, that's not the meaning of the biblical word of hope. See, the Old Testament, the Hebrew word actually it has the meaning of confidence, security, being without care. Therefore, the concept of doubt, it's not part of this word hope from a biblical perspective. Doubt is not in the equation, okay? The most, in most instances in the New Testament, the word hope is the Greek word that actually means that there is no doubt attached to this word, okay? Biblical hope is, it, it's, it is a reality and not a feeling. That's why we're taught not to follow after our emotions, to follow after our heart, or to follow after after how we feel. Because that's what can get us in trouble. Biblical hope carries no doubt. Biblical hope is sure, it's a sure foundation upon which we base our lives, believing that God always keeps his promises. I can count on him. He's going to pull through. I know everything's going to be all right. It just may not look like it. Even though I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, he's got this. Biblical hope, here's the definition of biblical hope. It's confident expectation. Write that down. Biblical hope is confident expectation. It's a firm assurance regarding things that are unclear and unknown. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but it's going to turn out all right because God's got this. You see, hope is a foundational component of the life of the righteousness. Without hope, life loses its meaning. And in, even in death, you know, if, if you're not, if you don't know the Lord, if you're not born again, you have no hope at death. But when we know Jesus, we know our hope is in him. Our hope is it, it's eternal. We know that there's going to be a resurrection. We know that everything's going to be, no matter what comes my way, I heard this one time. Shall we stand? I'll just share this with you. I thought this was awesome. So this evangelist, he's he's in a he's in a bad bad city. It's a bad town, like the worst part of this. Already a bad the city's bad. I don't remember what city it was, but the, there was a neighborhood he wanted to go and to do ministry in and go do uh, go you know do like one on one door knocking and just walk up to people and you know and invite them to a a, a revival or a, a meeting service you know that they were going to have and uh, all of the people there you know in the town that were members of that church was like you don't you don't need to go in that town that part of town is that's dangerous i mean people get killed there all the time every day you know there's gun, there's people getting shot and stuff and he's like it's all right so he goes and he's walking and these people come up to him and they were going to do him in you know they threaten him they they threaten to kill him and he was like you know well were you going to threaten me with with heaven yeah, <laughs> exactly. and i just thought about that you know for a minute wow that's fearless why He had faith. He had hope. He didn't have to worry about anything. He knew the Lord was going to take care of him. Did you know when you're doing the God's work, God will keep his hand upon you? 
what was the guy's name? Uh, he used to come through here with the cross, and he wore red. Everything was red. Obadiah Franklin. Yeah, Obadiah. He would go. Man, he went to. He would. What he. What he. What he would do is he would go in. He came into town. How many of you remember seeing this guy? So he's at Walmart intersection right there, and he's got this ginormous cross made out of railroad ties. I mean, it's one of those things. I mean, you've got to drag it. He, he carries it in two parts. You can't carry it all, you know, in one piece. And he stayed there out there in the hot sun all day with that cross yeah. over his shoulder yeah. like this and praying all yeah. day long. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, was, uh, he wore all red, and he was all red from the sun. So he looked like a, <laughs> a, a lobster, <laughs> you know, <laughs> being cooked. But you start, the news started getting around. People saying, who is this guy? What's he doing? And then the second day, he's out at the intersection. Third day, people starting to go on up and making connections. And then all of a sudden, you know, he started uh, having openings to come and speak at people's churches. And uh, yeah, we, we had him here a lot. We had him here a lot. And, and then just the stories, his testimonies of places that he had went to in Pakistan, on the corner in, in Pakistan, Muslim country, they hate Christians. Some of the most dangerous cities in the nation. And there's been testimonies of people, I mean, uh, spitting on him, cussing at him, throwing stuff at him. But whenever he gets down, down to the nitty gritty, people would try to go up and to try to do harm to him. There was a person that was going to go up and going to try to stab him. And God just stopped him and couldn't even move and touch him. When you're doing the Lord's work, and it, this, this is just one of many stories, though. Uh, not just with Obadiah Franklin, but with ministers, evangelists, and missionaries. And I mean, there's some, there's some, there's some stuff that would stagger your imagination of how the hand of God is upon, on his people that's doing his work. Perseverance, character, hope. Those are marks of a true Christian. It's not just about surviving. You just surrender to the Lord and let him do the work. I can't remember the guy's name. He was married to Jane Fonda. He was a multi-billionaire. Uh, Ted Turner. Yeah, Ted Turner said that Christianity is a crutch for the weak. He's an atheist. He's like, that's, you know, it's just a crutch for you to hold yourself up. You walk with the Lord for a while, and you go through trials and tribulations and persecution and people hating you. I beg the differ. You come out strong, man. You go through some stuff. You're promised. Can I tell you this? I'm just gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna shoot you straight. You're you're promised persecution. I don't know how a lot of these Christians think that everything is like kitty cats, rainbows, and bubbles. I got Jesus, woohoo, and it's great. But get ready. Get ready. The fight is on. Perseverance, character, and hope. This is one of those sermons. I mean, you know, the altar's always open. You can come down for prayer anytime in this. In, in our church, it's always open. There's never a closed sign on the altar. An altar is a place of death in the Old Testament. It's an it's a place where you. You bring things to God. You bring offerings. You know what the best offering is that you can give to the Lord? Yourself. You bring yourself down here and say, God, here I am. You throw yourself on the altar. The priests in the Old Testament would take, would, would, would take the animal and they put them on the horns of the altar and they would slaughter that animal. And that blood would just drip all down, and, and it, was, it was a mess. It's a messy thing that they did in the Old Testament. 
The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission or forgiveness of sin. Death happens at repentance. It's not just saying a sinner's prayer. You say the sinner's prayer, but the heart's got to be into it. And that heart is at repentance when I truly give my life to Christ. That's entering the birth canal of salvation. There's been a lot, a lot. In our nation, Christianity has been watered down to just easy believism. And what's happening is we created a lot of believers that believe in Jesus, but they've never made him applicable to their lives. And when the trials come, they're like a feather in the wind. They never stuck, they were never, they never had roots to begin with. And so what I'm telling you today, we've got to break this old mindset and become what it means to have biblical faith. True biblical faith, it's, um, it's unmovable. You're rooted. God said, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. And so what happens when your life begins to be shaken? What fruit's going to be left? What's going to be left? Are you still going to be standing? We've been shaken. I mean, man, since, I mean, over the last five years and even after COVID, you know, we had COVID, every, everybody's lives have been shaken, but it's still, it's being shaken even more like never before because God's wanting to see the remnant. God's wanting to see the people. It's like, you know what? I, shake it because I'm, I'm in. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes. And that's the attitude of a mature Christian. You may not be there yet, but keep your eyes on Jesus and stay in the race because when those troubles and those trials come, keep your mind made up. This is some of the best advice that I, I believe I could give anybody because I see so many people, they just get scattered when things happen. Don't get scattered. You're gonna get offended I might offend you. Somebody might offend you. Somebody in this church or another church, it could have been, it's usually somebody that you love that offends you. You know, and then we get offended and then, then you're all messed up. You got bitterness, anger, and it could be hatred and all of that. So just a bunch of nasty stuff comes out of that. Something's gonna come along. It's gonna shake your tree. And where are you gonna stand? As I wrap this up, we got a baptism. My wife's gonna come up. Um, I'm gonna let her take the reins here and whatever she wants to do with this, it's, your, it's all yours. I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go and do this. Hallelujah. Caleb, lead us in worship.
mother's arms are open wide Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing Christ is risen Bow down before Him For He is Lord of all Sing hallelujah Christ is risen Oh come to Altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give Jesus some praise in this house this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for being in the house of the Lord this morning. Love one another. You're dismissed in the name of Jesus. Amen.